the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is prayer time. Those who pray in faith can expect a miracle in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are praying for our pastor, Apostle Raymond J. Keith Jr. We are praying for the Keith family. We are praying for you in the name of Jesus Christ. Voices of Pentecost will give us our prayer song, and then Lady Tiffany Keith, amen, will take us to the throne of grace in prayer in Jesus' name.
God for deliverance. Have faith in God. At this time, the voices of Pentecost will come and bless us real good in song. Then the next speaking voice you will hear will be that of our friend, our brother. He is the pastor of the Tree of Life Church in Jeffersonville, Indiana, in the person of Elder Tamron Keith Sr. Let's greet them in that order by saying hallelujah. hallelujah. Amen. <laughs>
great. The Lord is great. Hallelujah. The Lord is great. Hallelujah. Our God is mighty and strong. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. There is none like him in all creation. He is the great I am. The everlasting father, the prince of peace. The great eternal wonder. Mighty God. Songwriter said, Zion righteous governor. He is the great. He is the great I am. And I love it because another songwriter came along and said, after all, after all I've been through, thank God I still have my joy. After all, after all that I've been through, I can give God praise because I still got my joy through the storm. Yeah. 
Hallelujah. We serve, we serve a good God. Amen. I'm glad I'm being able to be in the house this morning. This morning. There's a sense of sense renewal, renewal, renewal in the atmosphere. Hallelujah. 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 God, God is God is up for something. I'm excited, I'm excited about, about what the Lord is doing. Because what he's doing, what he's doing, doing is marvelous. Is in our, in our, our eyes. eyes. And I say, and I say, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, everybody. Lord, everybody. Yes, Lord, Lord. It is of the Lord's mercy, Lord's mercy, mercy that we're not consumed. His compassion, but passion fails, fails not to lose every morning. Every morning. Okay. Great is the Lord's, Lord's, Lord's faithfulness. And that we are so, we are so honored to be not only, not only in the house of the Lord, but in your place. In your place. First, first, honored, honored to be in the pastor, pastor, and the this, this, still standing, standing on the post. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Many have, many have off the wall, the wall, but he's still standing, standing. Amen. We honor, honor, man, man. The jewel, jewel of the house. The person, the person, the mother, Joe, Joe. She's still standing, on standing the on the wall. Still holding, still her, holding her post. Many have, many fallen. have fallen. Yet she, yet is, she is still, still standing. Stand. Amen. I thank, thank God, thank God for, for my love, my love, the bride, bride. Person of person of Tiffany, Tiffany Keith. We're blessed, we're blessed, privilege, privilege, so it takes, so it takes. The marriage, marriage was cool. The bride and bride down and down and had a wonderful, had a wonderful time out, hanging out. Couples, couples, both refuge, refuge, is lying, lying, feast of God, feast of God, even those, even those that weren't a part of the fellowship. But we're here, we're here, blessed, kind and kind and honor, honor. Elders, elders, ministry, ministry, missionaries, missionary, women of God, women of God, deacon, deacon, all, all of the people, of the people of God. Again, we say, we say to you, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Are you all ready? You all ready for the word? Yeah, yeah. I'm about to say, I'm ready. ready. I'm ready. Yeah. Man, if you would get your Bible, get your Bible and turn with me to the book of Acts, the book of Acts on this morning. We're going to be we're going to be in the first chapter. We're going to we're going to read in our reading. Verse, uh, verse number, number 12. 12. We're going to read from 12, 18, 18, 18, skip a few verses, verses, verses and go down, down to verse 21, 21, and then we will then we read our reading, reading, our reading, reading from verse 26. 26. The book of Acts, book of Acts first chapter, first chapter begin our reading, begin our reading 12, 12, and then ultimately, ultimately we read our reading, our reading at verse number, verse 20, number 26. Morning. If you are able, if you are able to stand, 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 stand for the reading of God's word, I'm going to be reading. I'm going to be reading from the New Living, New Living Translation. Acts chapter one, book of Acts, and beginning, and beginning, a reading, a reading in chapter number chapter one, number one, verse number twelve. We'll begin, we'll begin, we'll begin a reading from thirty one. And it says, then, then the apostles, the apostles returned to. On the Mount of Olives, the Mount of Olives, a distance, distance of, of half, half a mile, of a mile. And when they, when they arrived, they went, they went the upstairs, the upstairs room, room of the house. Of the house. And they were staying, they were staying. Here are, Here are the names, the names of those, those who, were who were present: Peter, Peter, John, John, James, James, Andrew, Andrew Philip, Philip, Thomas, Thomas, Bartholomew, Bartholomew Matthew, Matthew, James, James. Son of Son of Alphaeus, Alphaeus, Simon the Simon Zealot, the Zealot and, and Judas, Judas, son of, James. Son of James. They met, they met. They all met, they all met together and were constantly, and were constantly united, united in prayer, in prayer along with along Mary, Mary, the mother of, the Jesus. Mother of Jesus, several other, several women. other women, and the brothers, the brothers of Jesus. During, during this time, this time when about 100, about 100 believers, were believers were together, together in place, place. Peter stood Peter up, stood up and, addressed, and addressed them. 
Brothers, brothers, he said, scriptures, scriptures had, had to fill, fill in Judas, in Judas who, guided who guided those who arrested, who arrested Jesus. Jesus. This was predicted, this was predicted long, ago long ago by Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit speaking, speaking through, through King David. King David. Judas was one Judas of us, was one of us, and shared shared in ministry, in ministry with us. With us, Judas had bought Judas filled, filled with, filled money, with the money received, received for his for treachery. His treachery. Falling head falling first, head there, first there, body his body split open, spilling out, spilling out all his, all his intestines. intestines. Verse, number Verse number twenty-one. So now, so now we must, we must choose, choose a replace a replace Judas. 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 From among, from among the men, who, men were who were with us with the entire, the entire time, time we were traveling, we were traveling with, with the Lord Jesus. Jesus. Give me, give me knowledge, knowledge, work, and work, and close to, close to. So it says, from the time he was baptized by John until the day he was taken up from us. Whoever is chosen will join us as a witness of Jesus' resurrection. And so they nominated two men, Joseph called uh, Barsabas, also known as Justice and Matthew. Verse number 24, and then they all prayed, O Lord, you know every heart. Show us which of these men you have chosen as an apostle to replace Judas in this ministry, for he has deserted us and gone where he belongs. And then they cast lots, and Matthias was selected to become an apostle with the other 11. The word of God for the people of God on this morning. Somebody lift your voice and say, thanks be to God. You may take your seat. Now, I want to use these next few moments to um, minister to you from the subject, the accounting on this morning. The accounting. All right? Uh, we are familiar with the terminology or, or with the role of an accountant. I want to deal with the accounting on this morning. Man, when you hear the term accounting, we think of mathematics and finances and numbers and someone who's sitting at their desk, a stack of folders and an adding machine and a stack of receipts and invoices that they must tally on the adding machine to account for one's personal and or business finances and how they have been handled over the course of the month, the quarter, or the year. And while this is certainly one way of one's uh, finances to be accounted for, it certainly is not the only way. What do you mean by that? Not every accountant sits with a stack of folders and receipts on their desk. There's something called technology these days that allows lots of information to move digitally. Let the church say amen. amen. But most often when we think about accounting, we think about an individual, or we think about finances and how finances are accounted for. But accounting goes well beyond the realm of finances, right? And what is interesting is that when you think about the term accounting in the broader sense, it represents accounting for what anyone, whether it is an individual or whether it is a group or whether it is an organization, has done with the resources that have been entrusted to them. So you can be an individual and not have any money but still be responsible to give an account. I'm going to say that again. Accounting is not just about money. But accounting is about telling the story of what you have done 
with the resources that have been entrusted to you. So you can have no money, but still be responsible to give an accounting for what you have done. Because accounting goes beyond finances. Somebody say, the account. And what's interesting is that in the world that we live in, we no longer are being taught to live as if we have to give an account for how it is, in fact, that we live. Or the decisions that we are making from day to day. And to the contrary, we are, in fact, being told to live like we want without consequence or the need to give an account. I think the modern term, modern day phrase for it is, do you, boo? Do you? Am, 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 I, am, I, am I talking right here? Right? Do you gives no thought to how we might have to account with what we do with ourselves. It simply says, do what you want because what you want is best for you. But it ignores that down the road, whether down the road is a day, a week, a month, or a year later, there is going to have to be an accounting for what you did, the decisions you made, the choices that you took up, the people that you associated with. There is going to have to be an accounting. In 2 uh, Corinthians, uh, the fifth chapter, in verse number 10, Paul said it like this. He said, For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or the evil we have done in this earthly body. We must give an account. And Paul makes no reference to money here. But he's talking about the choices that we've made. The ways that we've talked to people. The ways that we have treated both our neighbors and our enemies. Because it's not good enough that you treat those that you love well. The Bible tells us to treat even our enemies with the love of God, even if they have done us entirely wrong. Paul tells us that we must give an account. And so it, it's not just about, account, uh, about finances when we talk about accounting. We're talking about what we decide to do with every area of our life. And it is here that I want to turn back to the Acts chapter number 1 text where we started where it says in verse number 12 that after the apostles had finished watching Jesus ascend into heaven and had returned to Jerusalem from uh, the Mount of Olives, it says in verse 13 that when they arrived, they went to the upper room where they were staying in, and it was here that Luke accounts for all those that were present. He says that Peter was present and James was present. John was present. Andrew and Philip and Thomas. Bartholomew and Matthew and James and Simon and, and Judas. And all of the disciples were gathered. They all met together and were constantly united in prayer. Along with Mary, the mother of Jesus. And several other women and the brothers of Jesus. And during this time, when about 120 believers were gathered in one place, Peter stood up and addressed all the people of God. Now, what I want you to notice here is that Luke, who is the writer of the book of Acts, gives an account for all of the believers that are present. And this is not very different than when God instructs Moses in the first chapter of Numbers where God says to Moses, take a census of all the congregation of the children of Israel. 
by their families, by their father's house, according to the number of names, every male individual from 20 years old and above, all who are able to go to war in Israel. The question is, why does the Lord command a census? Why does God demand an accounting of God's people? What you need to understand is that whenever God is about to take his people through transition, God calls for an accounting. Whenever the Lord takes his people through a transition, the Lord calls for an accounting. Question is, why does the Lord call for an accounting? It is it's not because the Lord doesn't know who he has on his side. And it is not because God does not know all of the gifts, the abilities, the resources, and the, the talents that God has blessed his people with. But God calls for an accounting so that the people of God can assess what we have and what we don't have. God does not call for an accounting because he doesn't know what we have. He calls for an accounting because he needs us to be reminded of where we are at this point in time in our journey. Because the reality is, is that what I have today is different from what I had a year ago. What I have today is different from what I had 10 years ago. And as time passes... What we have in our midst changes. And so while God is keeping a tally at every second and every moment of every day, we oftentimes are not. And so it becomes important to do an accounting. Somebody say do an accounting. Because we need to be able to put, assess what it is that we have and what it is that we are lacking, both in our spiritual lives, in our financial lives, in our relational lives, in our emotional life, every part of our life demands an accounting. Question is, when's the last time you did an accounting? And without doing an accounting, we find ourselves carrying things along with us that we should have offloaded a long time ago. A few years ago, a uh, lady by the name uh, of Jen Baird, I think is her name, uh, she wrote a book entitled Unclaimed Baggage. And in this book, Unclaimed Baggage, she notes the ways in which our human experience causes us to carry with us the issues of life that we have picked up along the way. So the hurts and the hardships uh, we've been dealing with in our Bible study, and even on this past uh, Tuesday we dealt with in Bible study with the issue of trauma. And in our unclaimed baggage, we carry a boatload of trauma. And because we don't do an accounting to say, this is what I possess and this is what I need to offload, we find ourselves toting things that we should have released years ago. And so, anytime in scripture when you see the Lord about to transition his people. There is an accounting that takes place. In the Old Testament, it came in the form of a census. But as we see in this Acts chapter 1 text, Peter doesn't call for a census. But there is a roll call of all those who are present. All those who are present and accounted for. Why? Because. The disciples are in the middle of transition. Well, what was the transition? Jesus had just died and spent about 40 days on earth. 
and had just ascended into heaven. The disciples had witnessed Jesus' ascension. Jesus told the disciples before he left, he said, I've got to go. But I'm leaving not because um, I am going to separate my relationship with you. I'm leaving because I need to change the way I relate to you. You all were used to relating directly to me in bodily form, but I want to go because my body needs to be grown and expanded. And if I don't go, my body won't be able to grow and expand the way it needs to. And so I'm going to go, but I'm going to send you the comfort. Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost that will infill you and will allow you to become a part of my body. So that even though I can only be in one place at one time, when the Holy Spirit enters you, you will become an extension of my body. And the body will literally be able to be all around the world all at the same time. So Jesus ascends into heaven and the disciples are sitting in the upper room waiting for the transition to take place. Where the Holy Ghost descends on the people of God on the day of Pentecost. And so they are literally in transition. Things are changing I know where I've been, but I feel like God is calling me to a new place. And in this new place, I need to take an account. Because there are some things that the Lord needs me to release before I can walk into my new season. And many of us are ready for our next season and our new season, but we don't want to take an accounting of what it is that we're carrying. Question again is, when is the last time you took an account? Oh, the things that you are carrying, yes, you have gifts and you have skills and you have abilities that God has placed on the inside of you. But how much unnecessary baggage are we totally? We come back to the text. Here we find that we are in a place of transition. And it says that in verse number 17, after Luke uh, gives an accounting to all of those that are present in the upper room, Luke notices and acknowledges that there's somebody that's missing. In verse number 17, it says, Judas was one of us, and shared in the ministry with us. But Judas fell off along the way. Why did Judas fall off? Judas fell off because although he was with the rest of the disciples as they followed Jesus, Judas was motivated by something different than the rest of his brothers and his sisters. Now, some suggest that um, Judas was motivated by money, which is why he was willing to sell Jesus' location for some pieces of silver. But biblical scholars have also suggested that Judas wasn't necessarily motivated by money. But Judas instead thought that he knew better than Jesus how to bring about the kingdom of God in the earthly realm. And so in that sense, Judas believed that it would be better for the people of Israel if Jesus would have been given up rather than the whole people of Israel sacrificed at the hands of the Romans. So that the Messiah might come and save the whole of Israel. And so although Jesus had clearly made certain that his disciples knew that he was the Messiah, Judas thought that he knew better. And that if he were to make an arrangement with uh, the, the Jewish religious leaders to sacrifice Jesus, 
that that would give way for peace for Israel until the Messiah showed up. So Judas thought he knew better than God what the plan of God ought to be. And what I want to say to you is that Judas is not an isolated individual or this is not an isolated circumstance. Because there are many times where we are gathered together as the people of God and we hear our direction and we get our direction from our leader, but we think that we know better what's best for the people of God. And so although the shepherd has laid the course and made it straight and clear, someone and some people among us say, I, I've got a better idea about what needs to take place to get us to the vision that has been laid out. Is what I'm saying making sense here? And we, we disparage Judas and see Judas as a sellout. But what I want to say to you is that whenever we decide that we know better than the leader and we, in fact, start acting out plans to do what we think is best when it goes against the will of the leader, we have put ourselves in the place of Judas. Judas couldn't see what Jesus had in mind. Because Jesus went to the cross and died. And Judas, I imagine, said in, in his own mind, well, Jesus can't really be uh, the, the, the Savior. He really can't be the King of Kings. He really can't be the Messiah if he's going to die on the cross. So, although we call him leader, Jesus clearly needs somebody else to intervene. To set the course. What I want to say to you is that God is taking his people to a new place. Yes. And God is not doing it outside of his leader. God works through his leaders to fulfill his will. So we can't uh, become so arrogant that we decide that we know what is better than the leader. Now, should we be uh, working with the leader and, and at times when we think that there is danger ahead, should we raise a flag to the leader and say, hey, want to make sure that you see the roadblock that is coming just a few miles ahead? Absolutely. We should serve as good and wise counsel to those that are serving in leadership. But we should never supplant what our leaders are doing. So Judas is not accounted among the 11 in chapter number 1 because Judas thought he knew better. But what an accounting allows us to do is it allows us to identify what it is that we have and what it is that we need. It allows us to see what we've gained and allows us to see what we have lost. And believe it or not, it was hurtful to Jesus to lose Judas. But it was necessary. Now here's where I want to I just camp down for a second and then we're going we're gonna to round up and we're going to end is that there are times that God is he's changing us and he's reshaping us and he's molding us and he's repositioning us for what is to come. And it requires us to let go of something from our past. And I'm thinking of people in particular who are in our lives that we love and are dear to us, although they're no good for us. And we don't want to release them because we love them. But you have to ask yourself the question. Even though they're with you, 
are they for you? Because there's a difference between being with you versus being for you. We can all be in the same family and still not all be for one another. Jesus gathers all of the people of God in the upper room and allows them to take an account to assess what it is that they have and to acknowledge what it is that they have lost. We had to let Judas go. But it wasn't of our doing, it was of Judas's own choice. Right, because Judas in his own guilt decided to take his own life when he recognized that he was in fact in opposition to Jesus the Messiah. What I find interesting about this text is that it shows us that there's a difference in how Jesus invests in people versus how we invest in people. Now, I need you to go with me for a second. Because the way Jesus invests in people is quite different because Jesus invests in whole groups of people. Even though he knows that not everyone that is a part of the group is for the group or for him. Even so, Jesus still invests in groups of people which is what we see with the disciples. But even though Jesus invests in whole groups of people, he allows the entire group to grow and mature at the same time, although we may be different fruit and growing different things altogether. Pastor T, would you, would you unpack this a bit? Yes, I will. Uh, because there are some among us who will always and forever be disagreeable. And there doesn't have to be a good reason for your disagreement. But that's just a part of your character and your nature. Even though God has called you to be a part of the body. There are others of us who desire to grow and mature in love. And we, we want God to fertilize our ground and make sure that our ground is watered so that we are growing in love. And while we are growing in love, others of us are growing in disagreement. And we're all growing in the same garden. We've all been called to the same garden. And we've all been called to grow, but what we grow depends on what we decide to nurture. And so Jesus invites the whole group even if there are some in the group who have ulterior motives. And that's different from our human nature which wants to cut people off as soon as we know that they're not for us. Lord, we need you to get rid of them. We need, we need you to intervene, move them out of the way. Because they are barriers, God, to what it is that we know and we can clearly see you are at work doing. Jesus, who in the infinite wisdom of God has decided that he does not cut off people before it's time. And so although they may be an annoyance to you, they are being used to bring glory to God. Although they may be a thorn in your side, that thorn is necessary to prompt you to move and grow the way God is forming and shaping you. 
And so you've been in this season of discomfort because there are some in our midst who are not prepared to go where God is taking us in the way that God is wanting to go. And our places feel like they're, they are dim. they're uncomfortable because there are people in our midst that we know are not moving in the same direction. But God is saying, I have planted them for a purpose and for a season. Somebody say, the accounting. We need to know who is amongst us. Because transition is on the horizon. And so we need to know where we have strength. But we also need to know where we have weakness. Because if we don't know where we weak, we can't. Push some additional resources in that direction. That the whole body might be built up. So God allows disruptors to, to stay in our midst. And it's actually the, the, the disruptors that show us the places of weakness. And it's actually the disruptors that calls us to be strengthened when we don't allow the disruptors to throw us off track. And so if God moves the disruptor, then essentially we go to the gym, but we have no weights to exercise with. So we lose our capacity to build up our strength and our muscles. So although I don't like the discomfort and I don't care for the disruptors, those who are not for us, even though they are with us, what I'm saying to you is that they are essential for what God is trying to do and where God is trying to transition God's people. Now, I've been using the term people and individuals but don't think for a second that this is just about people. Because God uses your stuff too. God knows how to use your migraines. For those of us who, who, who get migraines just all the time. Right? And, and we, we get nasty. We turn nasty to everybody around us because we got migraines. Now, I don't want to discount uh, what it is that you might be going through when you're dealing with your migraines. But what I want to say to you is that could it be that God has not removed the migraines because he wants you to pray a bit more when the migraine comes on instead of cussing out people because you got a migraine. The Lord knows how to use your stuff. And we have the audacity to get upset with God because of the stuff that we don't want that we have. Rather than recognizing that God may have actually allowed it. To use it as fertilizer. To get you to grow a bit. So that you will be ready when it is time to transition. Somebody say, the accountant. We're dealing with the reality that the Lord allows uh, whole groups of people to grow up together, even though they may have different motives that are operating their own agendas, that are operating within their own agenda. So although we are in a shared space and um, on the surface we say that we are all working towards the same thing, we actually may have different agendas that are motivating what it is that we do. And the Lord allows even the different agendas to share the same space. See that here in Acts chapter number one text. And I'll Actually, I want to I share with you just so that you don't think that, that Pastor T is just making this up just from one passage of Scripture. In Matthew chapter number 13, 
As Jesus is talking with some of his disciples, he, he, he gives the parable of the wheat and the tail. It says it like this. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. He says that in verse number 24, Matthew chapter number 13, he says, here is another story that Jesus told. It says, the kingdom of heaven is like a farmer who planted good seed in his field. But that night as the workers slept, his enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat. And then he slipped away. And when the crop began to grow and produce grain, the weeds also grew along with the wheat. And the farms, farmer's workers went to him and said, Sir, the field where you planted the good seeds, they are now full of weeds. And where did they come from? An enemy has done this, the farmer exclaimed. Should we pull out the weeds, they asked. Here it is. Verse number 29, he says, No, you'll uproot the wheat if you do it. Let both grow together until the harvest. Let both grow together until the harvest. Then I will tell the harvesters to sort out the weeds, tie them in bundles. I'm sorry, the weeds, tie them in bundles and burn them and to put the wheat in the barn. It is a heavenly principle that God allows the wheat and the tare to grow together. God's desire and design is not that the weed kills the wheat, but that the wheat is to be strengthened in spite of the weed. What are the weeds that are trying to choke out your joy? What are the weeds that are trying to choke out your motivation? What are the weeds that are trying to choke out your boldness to do what God says you can do? What are the weeds that are choking out your courage? What are the weeds that are choking out your faith? God is saying, don't allow the weeds to choke out what it is that I'm doing in you. But use the weeds to strengthen you in your resolve to do what God has called you to do. To use the haters and the naysayers and the weeds to prepare you so that when the time for transition has arrived, you, in fact, are ready. And so God allows people to be among us, even though they are not for us. And so what does this call for? It calls for us to, to possess the spirit of God. That the discernment of God might be fully at work in our lives. So that we are not distracted by those who are with us, but not for us. We are not, um, we are not taken off course by those who are with us, but not for us. For the circumstances that are going on in our life, we are not discouraged by them. But we see them as stepping stones to our next place of victory. We see them as stepping stones for our next place of victory. Can you see your next place of victory? I mean, can you show up in vision the next place that God has for you? 
2023 is a place of moving forward and a year of growth. And we are literally in transition right now. Can you see your next place of victory? Victory in my home. We did some work over the weekend on victory in our homes and in our marriages. Victory on my job. Yes, the boss is going to get together, but I'm going to get together too. Let the church say amen or ouch. What, whatever fits. Stop, stop slacking and lounging and be about your business. You've been called to higher places of leadership. You can't be like everybody else who just wants to lounge and lunch. While everybody else wants to hang out and take in a bunch of Netflix, God is calling you for more education and professional development. He's calling us to get ready for our next season. And he's trying to use your, your co-worker who works your nerve to motivate you. What do I need to do to get out of here? You steadily complaining and God is trying to get you to use them as motivation. Because he allows the weed and the wheat to grow together. You trying to get them fired. Stop worrying about your coworker. The Lord is using them to get you ready. So although they meet, they may be with us. We have to discern whether or not they are for us. And if they are not for you, you don't need to worry about getting rid of them. You need to stop your fighting. You need to stop losing sleep. You need to stop getting a bunch of headaches and frustrations over them. And over that thing, whatever it is. Because at the appointed time, they are going to fall off. Now, this does call down the necessity of prayer. Lord, would you, would you control this space? And although there may be people that are trying to work against me, would you not allow their plans to flourish unless it is in your will? And if it is in your will, only allow it to flourish for as long as you say and no more. Now, the issue here is that Although God allows um, those that are working against us to flourish for a season, because the season doesn't end when we think it ought to end, we stop praying that the Lord would allow the, se the season to end at the appointed time. And that's because we've gotten used to the season. We've accepted the disruption unnecessarily. But prayer says, Lord... Allow it to go on as long as it's necessary. But no more. Touch your neighbor and say, neighbor, as long as it's necessary. And no more. And you can't determine when no more is in your flesh. You can't determine when no more is in your feelings. You need the mind of Christ to know to know when no more has arrived. Because when no more has arrived, you don't need to do anything but start praising. Because when no more has arrived, God is going to do what he needs to do to move the thing, the issue, the person, or the people out of the way. But you can't determine this in your field. And when you rely on your feelings, you'll be upset when you should be shouting. And there are some of us that we have reached our season of shouting and dancing. 
but we're still wandering in frustration and anger. We're still, we're still entertaining our feelings of hurt and disgust and frustration. But God is saying, it's, it's time to shout, baby. It's time to give me the glory because the season has come to an end. And everything that has stood in the way, it will fall off at the appointed time. Because although they are with you, I know who in fact is for you. And I know how to make things fall off when they need to fall off. I know how to intervene and heal and speak a word of life when the time is right. Paul prayed. He said, Lord, I've got this thorn in my flesh. Can you remove it? And the Lord said, no, not yet. But I've got grace for you in the meantime. But there is an appointed time where we can put off feelings of frustration and hurt and worry and sadness because it's time to get our praise. And what I want to say to you is the accounting has come so that we can get our praise on. Because the accounting comes when transition is on the horizon. And the people of God are in the middle of transition. Transition from the elementary stages of walking with the Lord. To being seasoned men and women of God. Who can lift up the arms of our shepherd. In our first lady. To do things that they have been doing. It's now time to relieve some of the load. Transition has arrived. Stand to your feet. Hallelujah. I don't know about you. But I am super excited. For the season that God has us in. Because I know that God has brought us a mighty long way. And he is preparing to, to tip the scale to where our, our night season has come to an end. The morning joy has arrived. And what I want to say to you is you cannot allow distractions, the obstacles, the tools that God uses not to discourage. You can't allow those things that have discouraged you in the past to continue to discourage you. You cannot allow the things that in the past allowed you to be knocked off course and off purpose. To continue to do so. Because God is using this accounting. And God is using. Every detractor. And every imitator. And every deception of the enemy. As your stepping stone. And so. For those of you that are under the sound of my voice. Who feel it, you can sense it in your belly. That the season is about to change. Hallelujah. And you are teetering on whether or not you're going to give in to old patterns or if you are going to embrace the newness that God is calling you into. I want to say to you that today is the day to make a decision. And to make a stand that my past is behind me. And today I am pressing towards the mark for the prize of the high call which is in Christ Jesus. And it starts first with making sure that your call and your election are sure. Have you surrendered your life to Jesus? 
Have you made the decision to repent of your sins and, and to be baptized in water baptism in the name of Jesus that you might receive the infilling of the Holy Ghost? That you might be prepared and positioned just like the disciples in the first chapter of Acts who knew that change was coming in. And God had, had, had already begun the work of transitioning them from what they used to be. To the mature place that he was bringing them to. If you need to be baptized in Jesus' name. If you, if you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Today is an awesome day.